Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piskor. And today we're going to be talking about Early Savage Dragon. Word. All right, Ed. Savage Dragon miniseries, published in 1992, one of the original image titles, one of the ori original image guys. Whenever they announced image, I was totally on board. Most of my favorite artists, a couple that I, weren't my favorites, but didn't matter. Once they joined the team, I was there. And Eric Larson was my least favorite of all the names in that initial run. Yeah. Upon reading these books, man, uh, where does he stack up in your rubric? By the end of Savage Dragon 1, it was my favorite book and the one that I would do anything to get the next issue of. And it stayed my favorite for a long time. I read Savage Dragon probably longer than almost any other run of comics. And it was from the get-go, like... He hit the ground running with this miniseries as far as I was concerned. And we're going to go through and point out some of those strengths and, and you know, strengths and, and definitely more than weaknesses, I think, in this. But compared to the other Image comics, it seemed like this was the opportunity he was waiting for. And it made me go back and appreciate some of his older work then, but it really felt like he had been training his whole life for this. Agreed. Uh, and there will be editorials in here where we sort of discovered that 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 is is kind of true man this is 20 years later like after introducing the dragon character in that old megaton comic uh so those ide ideas are swirling around in his head but um from the get-go let's talk about uh these covers even man i have a few things to say one is that uh we kind of know that eric larson is a student of the kind of kirby school of uh comic book making so the dynamics are there but also you can't have kirby if you don't have like 1961 era um, marvel comics so there would be the titles with the adjective the yes. hyperbolic adjective <laughs> in the beginning but this is the 90s man so uncanny and amazing and incredible won't do and 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 rob liefeld already took the word extreme so <laughs> savage dragon perfect i can't think of a better adjective it it, it is Agree totally, and if that's not enough, it's also brutal and intense. <laughs> <laughs> All in the same cover. This was right up my alley, of course. You know, this is that era of post-Watchmen Dark Knight where comics get dark and, and violent and all the... There's a lot of criticisms about all that. That was my favorite stuff at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, like, this just epitomizes it. And, you know, talking about the covers, I'm not as keen on two and three, but I think this first cover is magnificent. His green against the reds and oranges behind him really pops out the character, it stands out, it sets a tone, and I was on board basically from this cover. I certainly tried duplicating this cover in my sketchbooks and notebooks. I was, uh, when, like, like Im Image, when they introduced computer coloring to comics and glossy paper, and that was kind of like a sales mechanism for them. You know, a lot of kids that I was coming up with, they, they were done with newsprint after the, the Image comics came out. Um, you know, as, <laughs> as men, we, we sort of know the backstory and how, and how these comics... Uh, worked and how they were put together and shit and and this is not a job that that eric larson's doing so the the colorist money is coming out of his pockets and i actually um think that this is like some of the worst like just the cut <laughs> just the covers yeah uh, i think it is like some of the worst uh computer coloring of those first uh image mini series we'll say with this like the colorist just didn't know how to treat the uh the fin um when issue one of the regular series comes out, forget about it. It's perfect. It might even be uh, Steve Olive or something. Like I like I don't know who who's who's rocking it, but um, only the covers are not colored great here. Like the interiors are just fine, and I wonder like is the colorist like thinking about the glossy paper so they're using more white? Um, are they doing the same thing as they on the inside as they're doing on the cover? But the glossy cover just kind of like shows a lot of this stuff that that i'm personally just not feeling but um one thing that is really nice on here and we've talked about hands in the past those are pretty killer like knuckle hand definition you know if you're thinking of, of it's a giant fist in the kirby tradition and an action comic fight comic tradition that's a hell of a fist and i was looking at this in preparation and thinking like that's really well done for knuckles and sort of like you know, suggesting what's underneath that green skin. He's really good at that, and we'll see a lot of examples uh, on the inside, man. But I've been actually paying attention to this sort of thing a lot with, like, um, the people I'm looking at lately, man. So I'm looking back at, like, old Sam Keith and shit. And th this is what I'm talking about when when I mentioned how, like, they, you know, the, the, the skull and crossbones kind of bones, like, 
they do construct their guys' fingers with those yes, classic that's exactly like, the like bones. Ch chicken bones, man. <laughs> yeah, I can totally imagine the bones underneath there, and that's exactly what they are. Ed. Yeah. <laughs> you ready to dive in? Let's do it, man. So this is the first wave of Image Comics, year one, published by Malibu Comics. We see their logo here. And any names in your uh, in your credit list stand out? Uh, Chris Chris E, I'll call him, man. He, I think he may still even be Eric Larson's letterer. And not a bad cartoonist, actually, man. I like, I like the comics that he makes uh, few and far between, but uh, they're pretty dope. Gregory Wright is a longtime Marvel colorist. He's done some writing, too, but I, I think he colored some of Larson's stuff, like on the Spider-Man title, is my foggy memory of where that name would link up. But definitely a, a colorist that I think Larson worked with and probably why he's here on these pages, somebody he's familiar with, trust, knows, you know, et cetera. From, from the jump, like, when I reread this story in preparation for the video, one of the things that kind of, like, spoke to me was... Um, you know, this is he. He is drawing these comics like in the tradition of the '60s Marvel in a way, like Kirby introducing new stuff on every page. But it reads at a manga pace, like a shonen manga pace. Yeah, that stands out to me too. Um, the first three, you know, this miniseries, they all start kind of in the same format, where it's a splash page followed by. Double, double splash, you know, like Kirby, big impact. Kirby tradition, man. Absolutely. And Ed, you talk about introducing things, you know, at a frenetic pace. There are a lot of characters that Larson shows up with already figured out, detailed costumes, you know, fun name. This is Cutthroat. He has a giant razor kind of weapon for for his lower right arm. Um, that stuff stands out to me. Like, it felt like we jumped into a universe here. Right, yeah, that, and that's exactly what Larson did, man. Like, with these, these comics, he created a universe now, in doing so, um, the story is going to be fairly breezy and minimal, we'll say, because he is introducing new stuff on every page, but it's kind of like you could almost dissect it as a, as a formula for, like, pretty good issue one. You know, there's a little conflict, there's some B stories involved, um, it, it, it kind of has everything, and you have to, you, you can't give short shrift to the context of, of the time, and... And, you know, Steve Seagal movies and Van Damme movies, like, those things are still hitting big time, man. So this fit the zeitgeist kind of perfectly, and those movies were paced as such. I have uh, one thing that stands out to me story-wise. You're right, this does read quickly. I think most of the comics, certainly the image comics of that time period do. Uh, I found three-act structure in the first two issues very clear, very neat. And so I'll point that out as we go along, but it speaks to what you're describing. Whether it's flashback scenes or B-plots... Uh, you know, and, and he establishes that stuff. Like there are things that continue to build through these issues as we go along and we'll point those out as we get to them. Um, but man, I, I just, I love this. I was oh, so, man. by this point, this was probably my favorite image comic. He, uh, from, the, from the jump, and we see it maybe a little bit here, but we'll see it more later when he really starts cooking. Uh, the tools that he uses for inking are not your average, you know, like just brush and, you know, 102. There's like, I swear there's like Sharpie or something and definitely like fine liners here and there, man. Um, but his, his ink line, um, it's not fully on display here per se, but his ink line uh, is, is different than any of those other image guys at the time. You know, he's very known for that strange way that he holds a pen and draws. Right. And so I don't know if that affects it or not. Um, <laughs> right. I always I found his work, that. you know, much more cartoony than, than the, than his contemporaries, mm -hmm. which you know, I had a love-hate relationship. When he was doing Spider-Man, I wasn't on board. But as he got further into this run, I was totally on board. You know, it added a certain humor. And we see a little hints of blood here. As we get deeper into this series, we're going to see basically an R-rated superhero in terms of language and violence. And I guess sex even, although I think that's more in the regular series. Um, that was something that I appreciated. Oh, definitely. You know, I mean, guys are beating each other to death. That is R-rated. Even if you're, you know, you're trying to get a comics code uh, stamp on the cover or whatever, make it, make it, soften it up. Like it's still extremely violent. Lean into it. It was another sales point, man. When, when me and the homies were chilling there in sixth grade, like, yeah, the Savage Dragon he tears people up, punches this lady in the face. Yeah, man. Hey, listen, glow, glow, should, bu, glow bug or glitter bug or something. She shouldn't try to live a life of crime. 
glow bug. See, these are some of those textures, these these like Larson textures that um, are just more organic than when everybody's trying to do their Erzatz Scott Williams inking. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a little, uh, it's a rougher chaotic thing. It's not that super neat cross hatching. This character, let's take a minute on his design. He has an eye patch. He's covered in skulls, both as like crotch piece, belt, shoulder pad, spikes everywhere. One arm is the giant blade and, and knives everywhere. That is that is a hundred percent early '90s image comic character design. Thousand percent, man, and <laughs> and uh, we're gonna see a lot more. I I actually love Larson's character Me designs, too. man, and and he's got such kind of an an imagination. Like he runs through more of a rogues gallery of villains than Dick Tracy. It's fantastic. You know, the rogues gallery is always a big chunk of these pop, like Batman and Spider Man. A big reason they're great, great rogues gallery, and so. For whatever reason, you know, Larson shows up with that in tow. Whether it's intuitive or just part of what he loves about comics, he's got lots of those villains lined up. And we're going to see it. So this is kind of the conclusion of this initial fight. And what we see, my notes say something about, this reminds me of RoboCop. It's just a super badass cop has shown up and he looks like the Hulk. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I got a hold of these comics very young and I read all the interviews about like, you know, go to life drawing, blah, blah, blah. Also, by the way, you could see, you could fill the skull underneath mm-hmm. these faces and, you know, sort of what we we're talking about, like about like the structure and stuff. But um, that said, you know, the rule of thumb when drawing an academically, you know, symmetrical head is like the space between the eyeballs is one eyeball distance and when i i knew that going in and it's supposed to be five eyeballs mm-hmm. why uh and then when i saw this i'm like i like this a lot and it doesn't abide by that so maybe those stuffy old dudes whose names i can't even remember maybe they don't have all the answers for me yeah for sure and so this is seven pages in average comics 22 pages i think i think these all run a little bit over that but if you're thinking of three act structure again this is about a third of the way through and we see We've established Dragon, great way to establish your hero, tough, all that. He's a cop, everything. And then we get down to here, and the guy's like, rough day, you know, he's bleeding everywhere. And he says, I've had worse. And we go to one of these subplot origin flashbacks. And so here we are in Act 2, and we're going to get to know Dragon's backstory a little bit. He is an amnesiac, so we don't learn everything, certainly not here. Um, Larson has hundreds of issues now to, to kind of dive into that. But we learn what gets him up to the cop moment. We do, and uh, this, like, I was such a schmucky little kid, because I was buying all of it, man, and I'm reading this stuff, and I'm like, oh, he's so mysterious, <laughs> and, and when we get out of this miniseries, and, and, and Larson tickles you with that last couple pages, man, how could you not buy issue one of the regular series? <laughs> this is the cop that finds him in the burning field and kind of recruits him, uh, Frank, a, a supporting character for quite a while, and we see him appealing to Dragon, but he's not really on board yet, and it's kind of weird the whole mystery of like, he knows things about the world, but he doesn't know anything about himself. It's yeah. a strange version of amnesia. And that's what we establish. And then we cut the Frank at home with his wife on the background on TV is super Patriot being maimed, you know, practically beaten to death in, in critical condition. Post dark Knight uh, comic, man, you got to have your, your uh, janked up superhero. So another one of Larson's fun characters. And we get a nice money shot where we get to see him in the, in the cool character design form. But he's not long for this world, at least not in this version. And this is actually where Frank is asking him about joining the police force. You know, he sees Mighty Man, or he sees Super Patriot beaten practically to death. The world that they live in, the Chicago that Larson's establishing, is completely overrun by superpowered freaks. They call them freaks. And organized crime has become just organized super freaks. And so the cops have no good comp you know it's, it's amazing they even have a police force considering the carnage we see unleashed on the police in this three issue miniseries <laughs> right. but that's the situation is the police are just regular powered people against against criminals that are just off the charts basically young blood ask this is a good view of the of the fin like at a in a profile view and whenever you see the fin done wrong they just the artist just didn't add that one extra fin up front they usually stop it too high yeah, that's exactly what they do, Ed. That's exactly it. If you're looking right at it, you're going to see the point of the fin below the skull line. Right. 
And if you're looking at a profile, it's almost perpendicular to the face, yes. that, the way that front comes out. I studied drawing Savage Dragon Fins a lot as a kid. Because you've seen the wrong ones, and oh, it's yeah. like you have they to figure out, out like what's wrong about them. And it'd be good artists that would get it wrong. Mm -hmm. It'd be guys I really liked, and then I'd see their dragon and be like, mm, maybe not. So at first, Dragon decides not to be a cop, and Frank gets him a job at his cousin's, or I think it's his cousin's yeah. warehouse, down on the docks, carrying heavy boxes around, you know? And of course, the uh, super freaks show up to extort this guy, and Dragon stands up to them, which... Sounds good in theory. Let's go back real quick. Because you did this uh, cover for a magazine called Super Mag. And you had this impact shot with like a foot on a dude's face. Yes. And I feel like it was like, there's. I learned some stuff from that shot of you drawing that. And I can't help but think that this is somewhere swirling around in your subconscious when you're drawing it. Because the, the way you draw imp real good impact is like squash and stretch yes so so cut that head in half and put whatever you know unstoppable force immovable object and you cut that squishy substance in half dude it just feels so much more brutal and it made me think like you know too bad uh larson didn't draw that doomsday versus superman very true ed when i see this i think of like domu whenever that whenever yes. he's pushed up against the wall and eventually through like a concrete wall good physics it's this is almost a trope of comics of that like impact how do you show impact into a wall and pretty well done there and the aftermath so he stands up to these super freaks it sounds great the cops get you know get an arrest and uh frank's cousin is is not happy like he is hysterical over what's going to happen now you know he knows the writing on the wall you can't stand up to those people so we're halfway through the book and we get a uh, savage dragon pinup eric larson Somehow I, I resisted the urge to pull this out and put it on my wall. <laughs> well, you know what? We'll see if you uh, pulled out the image uh, zero coupon as, <laughs> as we uh, go through these. One good use of this, this middle poster is that this is sort of a turn a page moment. You mm -hmm. know, a surprise. Like Frank's cousin's really upset and what's going to happen next. Normally, if you had pulled the poster out, you would see exactly what happened. It would ruin the surprise. But because the poster's there, you get the warehouse explodes. Once again, Savage Dragon emerges from the fire, uh, upset about what happened, and we cut to Frank's house, and now we're learning about Mighty Man, and Mighty Man has recently died. Yes. His secret identity, he switches into Mighty Man, kind of like a Captain Marvel Shazam, and in his human identity, he's been aging. He's an old man, and people find out about that secret identity, and they beat the old man to death. <laughs> So it's really bleak. Like, the heroes are dropping like flies now. Dragon shows up naked. That has to be a sight to see. I don't know, man. Stomach <laughs> might be a little bit gay, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and comes to Frank and says, you know, bad news, your cousin is dead. Good news, I'm ready to join the police force. So perfectly Van Damme, Steve Seagal. Yes. Like, like, my dad... By the way, end of act two. My dad would never read a comic, but he would love this movie. The acts really fit. Like, I, I do think that's part of Larson's ability, why I think of this comic as being written better than the other image books. Like, it, it's very basic, but so what? That's the formula we all know. All right, so from the end of Act 2, we cut back to the present time, and, of course, it's cops under siege once again. And Dragon bandaged up from his earlier tussle with Cutthroat shows up. <laughs> Doesn't even bother to put on the cop shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is you know the Terminator has shown up. Uh, I think Sin City probably just wrapped up or is in the process of wrapping up. So we've seen Marv with his little uh, band aids here and there. Man, it's a good identifier. Always love that look. Yeah, for sure. And this is Officer Alex Wild, who um, is a is a big time supporting character in Savage Dragon for a very long time, and a big part of the uh, the Savage Dragon Blood and Guts miniseries that that I really like that Jason Pearson did. Um, she's a good character, and she goes on to be a very developed character and, and one of Dragon's good friends. Yeah, I mean, like, it's another Robocop piece, man. I, I bet uh, if we saw the original pages, man, uh, we might have to, we might see some white out where she accidentally calls him Murphy a time or two. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, you know, it's also introduction of characters and supporting cast and stuff, which Larson does, again, I think, better than any of the other image books at this stage. All right, man. <laughs> you get your badass money shot. These are scattered throughout the miniseries where... It's not a splash page, but it's great. Like, again, I'm sure I copied this into my sketchbooks at the time. Yeah, I, I absolutely did. And, uh, you know, the storytelling of this page is abysmal, but kind of who gives a fuck? Uh, because, like, you know, you, you see this right away, but we're establishing some powers, man. 
Yeah, for sure. And I, it I, flows good. I was gonna say, like, it works all right. <laughs> I'm on board for this. And the situation is, these are, I guess, terrorist gang or whatever that have taken over this place and apparently killed a bunch of the hostages. I don't know if they killed them all. So Dragon goes in. It was a standoff until he gets there. He's kind of a one-man SWAT team through the roof. And uh, again, another one of those pages where, like, this is a splash page in most Image comics. On here, it's part of a five-panel page. This this image uh, was, was trouble for me when, when I was a kid because the black, um, for some reason, I didn't read, I, I, I never read this leg. So it felt oh, like, it felt like he was just kind of like doing this weird, like all of him is here. And I was just like, what the fuck? You mentioned color, Ed, at the beginning in regards to the covers. I think this is really great cover. You know, it's it's everything's lit by the red of the fire, the, right. the flame of the, you know, coming out of the front of the gun. And uh, and you see highlight on his face, so you get kind of the his expression and, and probably what most cartoonists would think of as the point of emphasis, you know, show the character's face or whatever. It's a shame about the leg not working, but... You got it now. No, yeah, totally. And I and I like when when I talk about it not not working for me, I'm talking about in like the split second that it takes you to read a page. Uh, I stopped there, and it wasn't for the sexiness of the machine gun. I was just like, what, what? what? All right, is this Peter David? <laughs> you know, on the page before, like I felt like these dudes were were designed like fucking next men and shit. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> He has a uh, he he does a parody of Next Men much later on in, in the uh, ongoing series. It, it was actually uh, in the Megaton Man crossover. Oh, uh, okay. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Um, another money shot. You know, like a lot of the image guys would talk about having a money shot, some kind of anchor on their pages that would make the original art more valuable than for resell. I believe Larson has all this original art still. I don't think he's sold much if any savage dragon art um but it still has that idea of like make each page exciting that's a pretty great shot agreed man and this is the dark knight homage yes sequence, exactly man. right through here totally dark knight um in line with the bandages that we're seeing that are probably a sin city homage clearly frank miller influenced a generation of these guys probably at this point multiple generations but i think the image guys were all pretty influenced by by what miller was doing down to the onomatopoeia i believe And the last guy is stopped by Star, another one of these characters, another one of what could be a mini pinup, uh, another cool design that looks totally different than Mighty Man and, uh, and Super Patriot and obviously Dragon. So again, like tip of the hat to having these character designs worked out and ready to go in this first issue. We have seen, you know, at least half a dozen characters that are going to go on for long runs in this book. Yes. And uh, you are on record on the channel several times. Uh, you know, you, you're a teacher. And you talk about the bursting of ideas that young students seem to have uh, ready to go whenever it's time to do class assignments or like, you know, er early maiden voyages and professional cartooning. Um, this is one of those instances, like a Kirby, where the guy ha carries that 20 years into a career. That's, that's rare. You can name those people on probably one hand. Yeah, that's a real good comparison, Ned. We hear about like Jack Kirby at the end of Fantastic Four last, you know, couple dozen issues, not wanting to give those ideas away, souring on that relationship, gets to the fourth world and explodes, where he thinks he's in a safe space. And it's like, we see it here with Eric Larson, and a lot of these image guys talk that way, where they didn't want to just give the characters to Marvel. That's why they made Image. And so when he gets his chance, it's just like, all right, I own you guys, let, let's let them loose. Yes. Boy, it makes for a great energy in terms of reading the comic. And then our final wrap-up page... After this scene has been kind of, you know, satisfactorily handled, Annie lets Star go, uh, lets this vigilante go, establishes the beginning of a possible relationship there between cop and vigilante. We see kind of like the setup for future issues. We get a glimpse of this organized crime, you know, upper level guys. They are not happy with this new super cop. Hanging around in their costumes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, what Mako is possibly going to do. I, I don't think he can find street clothes. Agreed, but I'm just saying, man. That, like, <laughs> and the, this is ridiculous. The hardest dude, <laughs> the hardest dude in Chi-Town, a city that freaking has, you know, 600 murders a year, um, has their super villain is a dude with a magenta cape. <laughs> I don't think that'll really... Uh, this is where we're in the realm of science fiction now, man. And it's purple, and that's royalty. <laughs> Crown royalty. All right, man. This is the most important page of the entire issue. This is what 
elevates this comic. And part of why I say as soon as I read this issue, that was it, man. I was on board. Because the issue doesn't stop at the comics. Like, everything that's in here is fantastic. And this is Eric Larson's, like, editorial, uh, you know, issue one intro, which most of the image books all had. His is just way better than anybody else's. I was 10, 11 years old when I got my hands on this for the first time. Um, I read How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. And now I'm on the hunt for 11 by 17 paper and a Windsor Newton two brush and all that. And I'm reading this editorial about a guy who's taking the same type of paper that's sitting in my mom's fax machine, because it was that era, and uh, just folds it in half and makes comics that way. I'm starting today. Like, like I'm making comics today. It's incredible. He says that he made over 50 of these comics, some of them 100 pages long. I know. And, and, and you know, we, we know people. We have friends who have kids who are 10 years old who did, like, 100-page graphic novels and stuff. And it's amazing, you know? Like, like this... We did a Kayfabe Weekly fairly recently, man. I told you, like, even when I was, like, a young dude and I would go hang out with homies and shit and I would feel fucking super guilty... It's reading this kind of shit that put that guilt into my craw because I'm like, I have no excuse. The Kubert brothers are already professional letters when they're 12. Uh, this guy did 50 comics when he's a little kid living at home. I did maybe like six. I got to get, I got to get busy. I wish I would have had that reaction. <laughs> I think I was just like, this is a guy from another planet. I can't do this. This is uh, this was a, a bridge too far for me at this time. But it traces the whole history, basically, of the Savage Dragon character, which also then dovetails with Eric Larson's professional history. So those kids, those kids comics that he made feature the dragon. That was his main character in those kids comics. And so that's the beginning of it. And sort of all these other characters, too, like have yes. their cup of coffee at the very least in there. For sure. Uh, he had the Society of Superheroes that the dragon was the leader, and a lot of these other heroes were part of that team. Pull that book out, man, because it's, it's uh, you know, like his dragon is here, and it's it's 1986, and there's also Vanguard, uh, who's going to come to Image Comics pretty soon. But, um, you know, he's not the same dragon per se, and he even works out the fin a little bit uh, cooler. Like, that's kind of weak, man. That wouldn't be a USA cartoon. <laughs> The new Finn design is way better. Yeah. But you can see he still has that, that the dynamics of um, what we think of as, as Eric Larson, even though he's figuring out the, the figure. Absolutely. There's, there's definitely, you can recognize this as Eric Larson art. 100%, man. Um, but, you know, the, the dragon character, he had, he had 20 years to mull it over. Yeah, 15, we'll say. and it evolves. You know, he talks about this Megaton version. That's kind of the next step in this editorial. And he talks about it and saying, you know, He's, he doesn't plan to reprint it or whatever. It's kind of, there aren't very many of them to begin with, but that's okay. This is a different character. You know, so he kind of puts it in context. You know, these other versions were trials. They were him working out stuff and he kept some of it and he changed some of it. Um, and so, it, again, it just kind of traces through that history. A couple of the things that stood out to me on reread is Dragon appeared in the last time in Giant Size Mini Comics number four from Eclipse Comics. That's yeah. a, a comic I have and never realized Dragon was in there, so that was kind of surprising to me to see. Oh, you should have dug that out, man. It's on the screen right now, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, finally, this is Dragon getting this series that he's always wanted to do. One sad note in this is... The year before this was published, there was a, a house fire, and it destroyed all of his childhood comics. It still breaks my heart to read that. Yes, uh, and and our, our business is paper. Our business is fucking kindling, and that is not the only severe fire story that destroyed a lot of stuff in comics. You know, Wally Wood has one. Um, there are several people that, that have that story, and uh, it's brutal. It's bru it's so fucking scary, and uh, when things are going completely right in life, uh, for me personally, and I'm laying in bed at night, and I'm trying to catastrophize what could the next problem be, that thought pops in my mind. I hope my house doesn't catch on fire when I go to sleep. One great thing, looking back on this now, is he says he hopes that this new series will dwarf those, ch those kids' comics that he made, you know, and, and again, 50 of them or so back then. Good news is he's approaching issue 250. So, you know, there is a victory there. You know, his goals to keep this going and to really build something have happened. So a bit of a happy ending. Yes, and uh, he'll, he'll flesh out his goals 
in future editorials and and it'll become a thing where he's like okay man dave sim is on on route to like hit 300 issues with with a cerebus i want to do 301 issues <laughs> <laughs> well we're all pulling for him so this is a this is an amazing start in my opinion and I must have read this editorial over and over as a kid. Dude, I'm so glad you say that because same for me. And he's not going to stop that energy in future editorials. I don't think that we get one in the in the rest of the miniseries. But when he starts up the regular series, it's a bet. Yeah. All right. So that's issue one. And, and it took a couple months before the second issue came out. Like all the Image Comics, I think they were required to ship late. Um, he does warn us. I think he was going on... Uh, getting married honeymoon but between these issues yeah. Or, or yeah honeymooning so uh freshly married at this point in time so congratulations to him on that one too and uh let's get into issue number two ed bust it open dude second intense issue not a great like young cartoonists and i'm not talking to, to larson here but young cartoonists you're, you're you're establishing a new title let us fucking read the fucking title and say issue two. Say, That's a bad say, choice. Say maybe the first ten issues. Let us see the title. I This is definitely my favorite of the batch. This is iconic. Yes. This is probably my second favorite. And the thing is, like, at least the lettering stands out really well. You know what you're looking for here. Um, that's, a bad, that's, a, that's a bad design. Ooh. <laughs> same creative team in place. And again, same format of let's open with a splash page. This is a good one, man. He's in the sewers. Born again patriot. So good lighting, by the way. Oh yeah, nice coloring. Yeah, it's those cool colors. They sell that underground. Boom. How about that for a villain? It's now like let's fucking drop off the color. Let's get an outlaw comics territory, dude. This is the dark man. They are underground. There's a uh, splatter. You know what I mean? He's busting out the the ink toothbrush and all that shit dude very grimy uh presumably dead children which is always uh, a beautiful trope of uh, the the outlaw comic this character basically a spider-man uh goes by arachnid and his dialogue is arachnid's got pieces of guys bigger than you in his fecal matter this will not uh be the first time where uh where eric larson uses good humor from uh you know, exploiting the humors of the body. <laughs> <laughs> there is humor throughout this book, which is pretty rare in the image comics of this day. And I think that spoke to me too. You know, it was fun to read these comics. It's true. It's true. I, and and uh, also the the other image comics, they would do that, like, they would try to do that poetic captioning that like a Alan Moore would do. And Alan Moore was actually not even always successful with it. You know, go back and read Miracle Man. It's a tough Man. haul. Go back and read Miracle Man, and there are cap captions there where it's like, he's just, Alan Moore's just jerking off all over himself. Now when you get guys who don't even really read books and are on record for not reading books, now they're going to do their poetic fucking <laughs> captioning? <laughs> not a good I idea. I don't think so. <laughs> hey, this character design is awesome. I think that so, That face is just, it's so gross. It reminds me of Ted McKeever. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Larson brings in influences. Now and then you'll see like a Bill Sienkiewicz kind of maybe some razor blade dragging across mm. a, across ink lines or something like that. Um, there's an issue he does that's very Chris Ware-like uh, in the ongoing. So, you know, he's looking at a lot. Like, I think he's conscious of quite a bit, even though he has a very distinct style. You'll see these little glimpses. And to me, that's a great character. I agree. Very different than the other characters we've seen. Yeah, le there's Leatherface influence to <clears throat> yes. it. And also, there's the two dominant arms, and then there's like, these yes. skinny, gnarly uh, little ones. It's nice. It's gross. Yeah. I do only see six, though. But I guess, okay, the, well, the legs, legs count. Yeah. yeah, okay. And he's just round. Speaking of uh, Chris Ware character design, he's 100%. This is just an egg. Cir circle template. <laughs> <laughs> You know, th uh, that's one of the things that, that um, I really like about uh, Larson is um, when you look at the character construction, the figure construction, you could tell that he's like has the shapes mapped out of like the basic torso, mm -hmm. pelvis, legs, and he can twist them up in any permutation, any directions he wants. And he puts that on display all the time. And it always, it always fits and it always works. That's another thing that the other... Um, the other uh, image guys really couldn't do. Jim Lee could do it, but um, you know the other dudes when they were, they they had six poses or yes. they would use heavy amounts of black ink or something to hide their deficiencies. Wow, 
Once again, seven pages in and he defeats the bad guy. Yeah, and, and here's more of like, these are bolder lines than you would see in a typical image comic. Like, this is this is a Keith Giffen kind of line. Like, it's just this thicker line that, that really, it fascinated me. Um, it was different from, from all the rest of those guys. And it just, there's a life to it. There's a bounce to it that um, is, was pleasurable in the, in the world of that very polished Scott Williams inking, Danny Meeky inking. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It is definitely a rougher, it's not exactly gestural, but it's definitely a rougher handling of the inking, which spoke to me. And you'd see this in guys. I think Klaus Jansen has a line like that. You know, I think yes. there's different, I think in some ways Tom Palmer Sr. has a little bit of that. And Probably the creator of that, because it seemed to be a, a, everybody was shooting for Senate or something way yeah. back in the day, and then Tom Palmer comes on the scene and Dick Giordano, and then they they have their way. So it so it is like an evolution of of that school rather than like the Senate school, which would be Scott Williams if we were looking at a. And I definitely tree. liked it. You know, at the time I wanted grim and gritty, and having that kind of scratchier, rougher line, it it captured that. You know, compared to a Scott Williams, it was so polished. All right, act two, here we go. Flashbacking to the hospital. This is kind of, uh, again, you know, working a subplot, bringing us up to speed, giving us a little bit more character background. And here we start to see Frank may not be as wholesome of a cop as we thought. Yes, yes, and it, and it immediately uh, interested me, you know? Like, I just thought, thought, thought of him as, like, a throwaway character. Like, give me more pages with Dragon. You introduce this to me. I need to figure out what the deal is. And, and, and Larson is good at that. You know, mm -hmm. he's such a student of, you know, Marvel storytelling. And, 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 Ser and serial, serial comic booking. Yeah. Right? You have, you ask some questions and, uh, Hey, stay tuned. You know, we're not going to answer everything, every issue. We're going to have some stuff going on. Answer a couple, leave more dangling threads. Yeah. And so answer a couple more, create more questions. And, and he, he, it's the good push pull. And it's actually the divorce of, the post Claremont superhero, you know, the the Fabians and the and, a, and a Lobdells and stuff, where they would just um, pull that th th that thread and 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 not give you anything, but just like keep introducing questions. And it's like, no, you have to have respect for your reader. You have to give them something, give them something every issue. And uh, he does that, and that is the divorce of like Jobber Comics, basically. Yeah, you know they were just introducing more for their own job security, telling the editor probably, "I'm gonna get to that. I'll get to that. I promise you." Yeah, and then just like continues <laughs> to introduce more shit. It's it's disrespectful. I think you're right. I think I, it was for the more for the editor than it was for any less readers. Yeah, it, it the 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 jobber comic has nothing to do with the readers. It's all about uh, keeping the gig. Another character that's introduced. I can't remember. If, this is Nurse Stevens. I can't remember. She may have been in the first issue a little bit, yeah. but it's really smart to have a nurse character because we're going to spend time in the hospital. <laughs> like we've been there a bunch already. We're, we're, you know, an issue and eight pages in, and we've been in the hospital multiple times. Like pretty smart to have have a recurring character in that hospital. Look at this form fitting. <laughs> That's a tight, <laughs> tight hospital gown on Dragon there. <laughs> This reminds me of Batman Year One. I'm not sure anything's actually lifted from it, but but something about it just reminds me a little bit. You can see Commissioner Gordon with his with his wife in that. Um, continuing, you know, this flashback. So he's going through the police academy and training, and he's this expert shot, and he's pretty touchy about the stuff he doesn't know in the past. You know, people are constantly asking him about why he's green, where he comes from, what the fin is, how does he know how to shoot, and uh, a little little touchy on that one. Yeah, and continuing the Marvel trope, man. He doesn't have to go fill a prescription and have no money for, you know, Aunt May. But he's he's green, he don't know why, and people are bugging him. All right, man. Super Patriot's back and, and redesigned. <laughs> yeah, he, he thanks... Rebuilt it, and redesigned. And the inside cover, he thanks uh, Fabian Nicieze for helping with the uh, de designing of the character. I bet Fabian designed that right there. <laughs> you know what this is from, I believe? I think... I think Larson had a proposal for an X book. Might have been X Factor. Can't remember exactly. But I've seen this was one of the characters that was in his proposal. Mm -hmm. So he may have been working with Nicias at that time to like put the proposal together. Because uh, I had that question too. Like when would he have been around? You know, in the early days of Image. But that's what it's from. I remember seeing it probably many years later. But it would have been an earlier proposal. And this is a little bit. I mean, this is carrying on the RoboCop idea. Mm -hmm. And it also, uh, I think, has a little bit of a nuke 
from from uh, good call from Born Again. Yes, a little bit because it's it's uh, you know m- patriotic hero, misguided do gooder, got the flag on the face. I dig this this des- I was super into this design uh, whenever it, whenever it came out, and I think fans probably appreciated it. There were several Super Patriot miniseries. Dave Johnson drew one or two, like the first ones, and it looked great. You know, I mean, he's just metal arms and legs. The arms can turn into guns. I, cool mask and everything. I think it's uh, Kirkman's introduction to Marvel Comics was on a Super Patriot uh, miniseries. I think, like, homies definitely have stories about Kirkman, the Battle Pope writer, like, hounding <laughs> Eric Larson for a gig for he definitely He definitely did at least one, one uh, Super Patriot I think it was Super Patriot miniseries. And then the other piece is McFarlane Toys does a Super Patriot figure that's really badass. Yes. Early, you know, pretty early on. A couple years after this, probably. But I remember that figure being really cool. So I like this design a lot. And uh, like you say, Robocop and Cyborgs, and he's back. This is... This is, uh, is um, these kind of lines... This is Larson pandering a little bit. Because he wasn't doing this kind of shit back in the day. But, uh, you know... This is like as close as he'll get to like a Scott Williams. And he kind definitely of evolves. If you follow Dragon, you know, he, he goes through a lot of phases and, and different tools and different approaches and stuff. All right, continuing some subplots. Dragon comes home from work and uh, the neighbor girl uh, strikes up a conversation. The scantily clad neighbor girl. It is ridiculous what she's wearing here. For, for sure. But, uh, you know, there is a smile on my face right now. <laughs> but it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the bad background. And, 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 and remembering that Eric Larson is like, was like the first guy who was like, if you write your comics, you don't have to draw anything that you don't want to. And we haven't seen a car yet in, in the world of Chicago. Uh, this is the apartment. Which is this basic, you know, sixth grade art class, learn, learn it how to draw perspective yes. kind of background. And uh, that's just what popped into my mind is uh, in fu- these future editorials, after we waxed a bunch on editorial on issue one, there are other editorials where he's just like, you know what? Writing is awesome because you don't have to draw anything <laughs> that you don't feel like drawing. And we should say this is the third uh, supporting cast member love potential love interest that we've seen, you know, an issue and a half in. Um, that was something that he did pretty well. You know, like there was a lot going on with Dragon's love life and like girls and women that he was interacting with and flirting with and stuff. That all added to the reading experience for me as a kid where it was like, oh, is he hooking up with this girl? Is that his girlfriend? What's going on? You know, like it just built like a lot of these strings of like wherever Dragon was at, there was somebody to bounce off of. Mm -hmm. And some relationship, you know, and those relationships ran a gamut depending on where he was at and who he was with. But there was always some sort of like, this is the relationship between dragon in this character and all oh, here now we see them in the hospital now we see them at the police station it was always something we have enough dragon comics in existence where i think we might be able to like deconstruct the way that he writes stories because he'll he'll give maybe two pages an issue for for like th- the love portion of his career or, or or of the character in this issue or something it's like it's like 11 pages fight two pages relationship two pages friends one page downtime. You know, I, yeah. I like. I bet you there's going to be a way to deconstruct. You may that be shit. right. That could be an infographic waiting to happen. There's another one. I drew this a bunch. <laughs> That's a great one. <laughs> All right, man. So we are back in business now. Let's call it Act Three. And there's police work to be done. By the way, what cuts this scene short is whenever his beeper goes off. Yeah, <laughs> a and little you, snapshot in time. And you see the beeps dark and yeah. and way after he sees it it's like so it's just like the storytelling of it is weak it is it's it's reinforced <laughs> in the uh, in the dialogue but off he goes to fight crime Mignola Mignola piece is here if you if you strip out the um color uh who was a big influence on on those guys at the time and and the Dracula book might have been out around this time maybe a little later around this earlier time. it probably was earlier because Hellboy's yeah, okay. maybe around this time. Maybe around this time. Hellboy's probably a year away or so. And the the use of like a hundred percent red and like the black and white, like this this really spoke to people, man. It was it was, believe it or not, kind of an innovation. And by the way, um, Hellboy will show up in Savage Dragon in the future. So in the ongoing series, yeah, it, yeah. It's no, uh, it's not a secret that that you know Larson likes him, and I think everybody in comics likes Mignola's work. But uh, pretty cool to see that team up. So. Um, oh, you know what we didn't say about Super Patriot is he was put back together by um, Cyberdata, which is the the Cyber Force, 
um, oh, creators of Cyberforce, right. Mark Silvestri's book. And so this is in the early days, there are these attempts that like this is a shared universe. Youngblood is referenced in Savage Dragon. And now I think this is maybe the reporter. I, I'm not they, sure if that's the reporter or not, but it's supposed to be and, from and, Spawn. And it, that reporter is like, uh, you know, in Underground Comics, there's the character Pro Junior. And that was like, everybody could draw Pro Junior. It's like, if you make an image book, like you could draw the three newscasters, you know, the, the white hair guy, the Asian lady, and the smarmy uh, douchebag blonde guy with the mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always forget about him. So what has happened is those three goons from the end of the first issue, the last page, they've taken a bunch of hostage, hostages in the mall, and, uh, and their demands are bring in Savage Dragon. They're looking to make an example of this new super cop. <laughs> this is a little kid's cartoon. I actually, I actually <laughs> downloaded it uh, recently. Yes. And the way that, that they just take all the teeth out of it, it's almost like, why bother? It's a shame because with the supporting cast that he has, one, it is a, a toy line waiting to happen. But also, like, this would have been such a badass cartoon. If this would have gone HBO route yeah. or maybe even MTV route, you could have made a cartoon that would have been memorable that was close to the comic. You know, that, that's the elements that would have made it stand out and be unique. All right, so here comes Dragon, and the bad guys, their answer is, you want the hostages released? They literally throw the hostages. Yeah. Throw them, like they're weapons and projectiles, and Dragon catches some of them, but not all of them. This was a promotional poster uh, that was done and available as like a bigger print. I did have that on my wall. Couldn't get enough of this kind of stuff, man. And I, and I started uh, these cartooning classes around this time, making my own comics with a, with a class and printing them up. And like, it was essential to put, call out your, your loves, man, in yeah. the, the graffiti on the walls. <laughs> For sure. Even Marat Michaels get some pimpage on there, man. And canals. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> advertisement for the upcoming dragon versus megaton man super quick yeah, that's that's a surprise this was fun too where they two artists both drew like half the book drew their characters like not not like i'll draw the first 12 pages but i'll draw when my character appears i'll draw him you draw yours that was such a fun gimmick i i agree man we're getting to some of the my favorite storytelling of, of this issue all right so again the dramatic moment before this this centerfold, which is almost like a hidden page turn that we get, is hostages just in the air, sailing through the air, not going to land well. Dragon tries to catch a few, gives up in an attempt to try to stop more carnage. But you see the carnage that is happening. That's a pretty interesting, like, I, I've never seen that gimmick. That's a pretty good idea for bad guys and hostages, superpower bad guys and hostages. Like, pretty like effective. Throwing water balloons. Yeah, man. So he jumps in, and, and at the last minute, Hellraiser pulls up this kid right in front of him, this hostage. Yeah, it's so good. Uh, you're, you're stopped in time at the page turn, so you got to flip it, man. It really is. Like, compositionally, you understand totally what's happening there. And you don't exactly understand what's <laughs> happening here, but if you stare at it long enough, you do. Yeah, it's it's good enough. This is a, this is a little bit of a pro wrestling move here. I'm not sure it would work in real life, but I, I think they, they work it out. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little coordinated. Yeah. Dragon flips over the kid, grabs Hellraiser by the head, and slams him into the ground. And now it's just a fight between these these three supervillains and Savage Dragon. And it's instantly violent, man. Blood is blood is flying. My favorite part about the Dragon comics. The red goes good against the green. Yeah, yeah. You get you get, you make green by way of red. <laughs> For sure. So pretty violent, but not good enough, as Dragon says. And that's when Super Patriot busts through the wall. Yeah. I was I was <laughs> dude, I was such a schmuck when I was little, because I was totally buying all of this stuff. Like, oh man, it's like he's he's no longer human. Uh, when we start to get into what Super Patriot Super Patriot's gimmicks can do, that's when she gets really fun, dude. When it's just like Deus Ex Machina weaponry and shit. Ed, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Kirby as being a big influence on Eric Larson, and I agree. Another big influence is Walt Simonson, who Kirby was also a big influence on. But Larson will talk about Simonson in letters pages, in some of these editorials at the end. He does a full splash page issue, and it's it's not an homage to the Thor full splash page right. issue, but he references that because yeah. that's kind of like the big one, you know. And, and I think that's the one everybody points at whenever they think about that as a storytelling device. So he's a big uh, Simonson fan, and this lettering to me speaks of like the John Workman lettering that we would see in a lot of Simonson's comics. Absolutely. Um, definitely, I think that's probably where it comes from. Absolutely. 
Except, except workmen did it shit by hand. Like, I don't know about this. I don't know. It's it's pretty early on for digital, you know? Like, it just wasn't part of the part of the uh, workflow, I think, yet for everybody. But it, it could be digital. I don't know. So um, what happens is Super Patriot shows up, and he just starts killing dudes. The bad guys, but still killing them. And Dragon's like, whoa, whoa, you're killing them, you're murdering them. And tries to stop him. The most puzzling part about the Super Patriot design for me when I was a uh, shorty really was the white hair. Because, like, you never saw a superhero with... It's, like, not, some... it's not this choice for his... Uh... For his uh, bottom costume? His Borat That's a, that's a pretty brief... Uh, <laughs> those are some real briefs. <laughs> it's okay, because it's just uh, covering weaponry anyhow. Uh, yeah, the ponytail is a, is a weird trick, and that, that's an odd piece of the uh, McFarlane toy, if I remember correctly. Mm. I think that's like real like Barbie hair or something. I think. <laughs> yeah, it's not a sable hair, man. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's that nylon stuff from that Pentel brush pen. So Dragon stops him... That turns then to Dragon Super Patriot fight, of course, because that's what we're all here for. Totally, yeah, like that. That's the thing. Like Larson, the to me, these are forget the blood, all that, and sex. All these are boys' comics. Yes, and uh, if you could tap into the part of your brain that like got you into comics when you were a little kid, like this shit is in here, man. Unapologetically, this is like if if Marvel comics would have been aimed at I don't know seven eight year olds. This would have been like the 12, 13 year old yeah. version. Because it's like, there's going to be some girls. It's going to be R rated blood, bad language. You know, like it was like the perfect ratcheting up. This is what I was renting at the video store. What are, yeah, exactly. What are the cool movies that are out? Terminator, Robocop. You know, I was chill with your pops watching the Delta Force canon movies and all that, man. And, and uh, urban setting, co- cops, uh, you know, uh, lethal weapon. So Patriot's about to punch Dragon's ticket right there with a. With, 20 large guns <laughs> point blank in the head Murph <laughs> <laughs> whenever Dragon's uh, partner we get to see her again now in, in the second issue shows up just in time to say Freeze he's a cop and for some reason this has like a distilling effect on Super Patriot you know he can't process it you start to see like the mechanical robotic side of him breaking down very like Robocop. Robocop very much and he, and he says it uh, in, in the style of The Wire a police. A police. <laughs> <laughs> it gives Dragon just enough uh, enough to regroup and then basically knock out Patriot. But Dragon's in bad shape, man. You see him holding holding his guts together as blood is just coming out. And, uh, and that's what we get two pages to close on here. It's basically Dragon bleeding out in the middle of just a lot of bodies. That is... I don't know how the police can spin this in a positive way, man. There are a lot of bodies and pools of blood there. Another drawing exercise, another thing that I learned from from this issue is... um, How to draw blood. Perspective. Like, this is not proper perspective. This is just tape down your your page in one diagonal, throw down a T-square, do a bunch of lines, and uh, what what is it? It's not called perpendicular. It's uh, the kind of isometric uh, like like the isometric perspective which is not real life but hey it doesn't matter this works for me it works perfectly he fakes a lot of perspective i was even looking at this issue one cover and i'm not sure all these lines converge mm. on the same point but it doesn't matter it works it's very dynamic and i would say the same thing here and that's something that i've learned like there are a lot of things that i draw that are sort of a fake perspective mm-hmm. because it works nobody's confused by this it looks good there are other people who can do it I can't. Like, when I have, like, a big surface yeah. area, um, my lines start to tilt weird and stuff, so I have to, like, provide a grid for myself. Uh, same with lettering. Like, if I if I don't letter with the aims, it starts to yeah. tilt just naturally, and I just, it's always been that way. I can't, I can't do, do anything about that. All right, man, this is our cliffhanger ending of issue two. Uh, pretty good. Dragon is down and... Maybe dead? <laughs> I don't think he's dead. I don't think so either, man. But we go to uh, we go to the first kind of letters column now that we're going to see. Savage Dragon had a great letters column pretty much from the jump. And so we get a little bit of uh, explaining, you know, his late honeymoon, all this stuff, and kind of talking. This is a little editorial. It's just updating what's going on here and there, different stuff, talking about the great response that they've received. Um, he's having a letter column, you know, name the letter column contest. So it's going overall, it's, it's, it's business. It's just doing some business. And then he gets into the le- letter columns and it's really neat what he does first. He does a Q and a, so he just pulls out questions from, I guess, a lot of the letter writers. So you get a really quick back and forth. 
him and them answer, you know, answer a lot of mail in a lot of ways in a very brief space and then get into more of like the traditional letter column stuff. Smart use of, uh, of the format. Um, social media doesn't exist. Uh, there are like legendary stories that Klaus tells about like the community that kind of developed around his, uh, letters pages and and how people, people met one another. Um, McFarlane on his Spider-Man stuff insisted that he get the letters and get to respond and do all that, like just making good use of the format and building some relationship with your readers in an era when it wasn't that easy to do so. This stood out to me on the reread, Ed, because it is such a great use of space. Like he's got a few tricks and he's trying all of them. Fan art. We love it in Wizard Wizard Magazine. I loved it back then because this is the kind of crap I was drawing. You know, like like this this made much more sense. Like I might get a piece of fan art printed in Savage Dragon, and it was cool to see. Again, I liked seeing different interpretations of a character. It'd be great if it were artists that I loved, but it was kind of equally effective just seeing like, all right, man, you know this these are different styles, and it's still this character that I'm digging. Yeah, and uh, you know what? Uh, just like the Wizard episodes. Every now and then, you see a future professional show up, and uh, it's going to happen in issue three. Well, one last piece before we get to issue three. Closes out the letter column with one of the greatest things, maybe in this miniseries, and that is a how would you like your character to fight the Savage Dragon contest. We'll see the results of this for like a year, over a year from now, but this is laying down the groundwork for what's a chance to send in your hero or villain and uh, Eric Larson's going to, uh, you'll keep the copyright, but he's going to use that character for issue 10. And I don't know if he names the prizes. I think you get the cover art maybe from that issue, but the hell with that, man. The chance to have your character fight Savage Dragon by Eric Larson. Wow. That I, is really getting your money's worth out of this this piece of real estate by Eric Larson. I sent one in. I did. D- do you remember your character? Mine, mine was like a, um, it was like a Mega Man kind of robot. Mine, guy. mine was a team, and I can't remember the name exactly. It, it might have been Blood and Guts, and it was like a man and a woman team, and it was it was just the most generic '90s, you know, shoulder pads and guns. But then Art T Bear saw your design and <laughs> created uh, black and white, <laughs> and then other image ads, of course. Yeah, which of these is not like the others? Poor Malibu. <laughs> <laughs> they did what they could, man. It's funny, we talk about Eric Larson really taking advantage of the real estate that he has on these pages. Malibu has some of the biggest selling indie comics of all time. They get a back cover ad, the most valuable piece of real estate besides the front cover. (laughs) That's what they have ready to go. And and they're still pimping. (laughs) I mean, this looks like a Roy Thomas fanzine team from from Alter Ego in 1961 or something. It's like they are totally out of touch. It's a far cry from this. This is what you're on the stands against. (laughs) Well, hey, they'd get it right, though. You know, give them a year to get ma- to, to respond. They get the Ultraverse together. Well, I guess if, if the goal is to sell it to Marvel. <laughs> All right, man. Savage Dragon issue number three. This is the end of the miniseries. And uh, here's how you boost sales. Put, have a big guest appearance in, in issue three. Several. Uh, because, be- you know, Bedrock, as he was called at this moment, uh, you know, that's a Rob Liefeld, Youngblood character. But I th- I think, uh, is it this issue where we also see Spawn? Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is, I don't think anybody would disagree. Like, Larson, when you look at the founding fathers of, of Image, he wasn't one of the, the top tier guys. It was, it was Jim Lee, it was Rob Liefeld, it was Todd McFarlane. And those three guys... They would they would help their homies out, man. Like they would, you know, let this character, that character, show up in Shadow Shadow Hawk or whatever. And and it's a effort to bring you along and and, and give you some some energy. So uh, yeah, and it's happen. also a history of comics. You know, like a lot of comics. If you look at Marvel, like a new series issue three or four, Spider Man shows up. Uh-huh. So you know, these guys are coming from that school of thought too, and it is potentially a boost. But I think this guy, man, could have could have sold plenty of him on his own, man. <laughs> Inferno. I love, it. I love it so much. So we see again one splash page, two splash page. This is the formula for these. And as I said, I was on board. Kept that two toed foot. Yes. Which makes the turtles cro- the inevitable turtles crossover. Uh, once you see the two f- two toes, issue number two, <laughs> regular series. I was there. So here we are in the hospital again. It wouldn't be a dragon comic without the hospital setting. And uh, 
he gets rid of this dude quick. The previous issues, it took seven pages. This one takes three and three and a half. Um, again, nice impact into the wall. And basically, he's recovered. So they talk a little bit about that recovery. He went from being in really bad shape to back to full strength. And yes. So it's kind of about his healing factor. We get a little information that you know you heal a little bit quicker than uh, the average cop. <laughs> yeah, he really is like uh, uh, he he has no kryptonite, man. Like like Larson loves this character, and he's not interested in giving him any true obstacle. They talk about the. Uh, Super Patriot, what happened after, you know, this is a recap of what happened once Dragon loses consciousness. And Super Patriot, weirdest thing I've ever seen. It was like he was under remote control or something. He kind of got up and crawled off, but didn't even seem to be conscious. Laying some groundwork for future Super Patriot fights. And uh, Officer Wild makes some comments, you know, was very concerned about Dragon. And uh, he, he doesn't let that go unnoticed. <laughs> All right, so here's Overlord. He's unhappy with Super Patriot. He's severing ties with Cyberdata. So, Mark Silvestri, you're out. <laughs> and one of the hostages that Dragon rescued earlier comes to pay him a visit in the hospital. Two-page love sequence. <laughs> let's let's get through this one real fast. And you know what? A million panels. Let's let's get in. Let's get out because there's fights to be had. Good call, Ed. Good call. And we see some media, throng of media, as Dragon comes back and joins the forces again. It gets very ridiculous as they talk about, does he really have amnesia? Was he a criminal, a thief, a murderer, a child molester? <laughs> like, it's just, it is, uh, this is melodrama, I suppose. This is high drama, James. <laughs> this is pathos, man. Ah, I see, I see. Uh, woman reporter kind of gets him alone, try to try to flirt, get a couple questions out of him. And before anything can happen blindsided yeah by a government agent a 13 year old boy who's seven feet eight inches tall built of rock what an asshole dragon steps out of the hospital before he can even get to his car that's when bedrock decides to sucker punch him i don't like like this is unconscious to rob like i'm sure he wasn't thinking about this but when i was a little boy when when i was uh reading this shit and it was middle school era it was puberty era I got into fights in elementary school, and it stung. When uh, when we got into high school, some of those dudes who shot up to seven feet tall, this one dude I knew, Brian, whenever he didn't want to be in class anymore, he would punch a dude in his chest, make them pass out, and get suspended for eight days. Like, uh, that's what Bad Rock it was to me at this time. That's how I identified him. He's he's like a... He, because he's a little, he's a little kid. Um, but he could beat up his own dad, but is immature as fuck. Yeah. I don't know if I'll ever do a comprehensive vein artist list, but these are pretty good veins. Yeah, uh, with good help by the, the colorist. You know, the colorist helps make them shits pop um, and, and, you know, abides by the light source that Larson paid, put down in ink. So it works. Like yeah. whenever you have both things work in service of one another, that's when you have like a good, a good vein structure, man. <laughs> All right, so this issue departs from the clear three act structure. It's probably there if you if you dig deep enough. But but he's starting to I think enjoy the writing, maybe feel a little more confident and just go with his ideas. And it's a big fight. It's a back and forth fight, but it's just a big fight between these two. And Dragon even realizes early on, like he recognizes it's this is a young blood dude. Right, and then the, you know there's there's fourth wall nods to Marvel Comics. Um, you know, it's it's silly. So they're fighting in an elevator shaft. Not sure why. Yeah, you would think that Bad Rock would would um, be too heavy for the weight limits. You'd think so. And uh, and we get half a page uh, guest appearance. Bad Rock, as you say, Ed, not the only image superhero guesting in this issue. It'll be a full page when you turn it. It's funny. This is the misdirection where these two kids are like. Rob, look, it's that new superhero. Right on, man. Let's check him out. And uh, Spawn is, is worried, like, how do they know it's me? So much vanity. <laughs> Turn the page. Uh, they're, they're running to a wall of televisions behind them. And this was in a Spawn comic. This was, this was in, you know, one, an issue of Spawn. Uh, I, like, it looks like Larson, but then this looks like McFarlane here. So, so I don't know if it's not, like, exactly just traced or something. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it not, it's, not, it's not statted because this is clearly Eric Larson inking. But that looks like McFarlane, so I just don't know. And we're back to the uh, the showdown, continuing this fight. It's hard to do a compelling fight. Yeah, like I, I don't have any experience with that, man. So I, I when when you do superhero comics, or when you have to draw people, like it makes you respect the superhero artists. I was thinking about like Robert Crumb doing the Book of Genesis. Um, it was the first time like he had to do like normal people in normal settings like consistently for a long time, and he was looking at uh, mainstream comics artists and just like paying lots of respect for their ability to draw the figure. This is Robert Crumb, a guy who has bought a house, a chateau in France with his sketchbooks, who'd done a ton of drawing, who didn't draw the figure yeah. in a million different poses and, 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 all, and that sort of thing, man. So mad respect for the superhero artists who kind of figure that shit out. This is a nice moment. After uh, Dragon knocks Bedrock into the water and he's kind of looking and says, hope you can swim, punk, and everybody's kind of aghast. He has remorse, and so he dives in to, to make sure he's okay and doesn't drown. Punches him again! Bad Rock, man, what a jerk. <laughs> this, this is Mignola-ish type shit to me, man. Like, like cutting off the ankles, like having the hatching, kind of like the atmospheric hatching into nothing, triangle, triangle feet. It's neat now, you know, we've seen them fight through the evening into the darkness. This is the gimmick, man, where I was like, oh my God, is he, is he Rodney? We all were. Yes. <laughs> and, then, and then the old lady shows up several times, man, and it's like, wow, how did Rodney get to be that way? I don't remember this ever being resolved in any way, was it? Do you remember what Not that I remember. if Rodney turns out to be somebody? Yeah, no. I, 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 but she definitely is treated as a kook, like yeah. by the police department and stuff. I have to might have to keep rereading Savage Dragon get to the bottom of this. I've, I've been looking for an excuse. <laughs> All right, so this is the knockout punch finally. And that's a five thousand dollars spread right there. And Dragon's pissed. Bedrock's uh, whole reason for this happening is to see if he was tough enough to join Youngblood. Stupidest thing I ever heard. And so uh, then he's like, "Well, sorry, can I go now?" And Dragon says, "Hell no, you're under arrest." I kind of dig that. I'd say uh, at least a, a minor twist on this kind of nonsensical fight. Sure. Like, let's put some repercussions on you behaving badly. Yeah. And then Dragon goes home again after this, uh, not even a day of work. After getting out of the hospital, fighting <laughs> Bedrock, he finally gets back to his apartment. And lo and behold, Debbie's waiting for him at his door. So uh, she asks if she can stay the night. He's a gentleman. Well, he tries to set her away, man, but she really uh, asks, man, several times, please, so he's happy to oblige. <laughs> and and two, that's two, our... Uh... Two no's and a go, <laughs> is what they say in the, in the sales force, man. And cut back to the police station where Shaft and Die Hard have come to uh, bail out bed, Bedrock, and he's going to have to be more careful, and, and this is going to cost him some money. Tens of thousands <laughs> of taxpayer uh, dollars. This is the most character Die Hard ever had, too, man, in the, just this one... <laughs> balloon you should be more careful like like that's that's the most character that's ever gotten across for the diehard character and then we close basically we close this miniseries with uh dragon's friend and fellow police officer frank getting a call in the middle of the night and it is the vicious circle basically being like uh revealing to us that that frank was involved with that whole warehouse situation that turned the drag motivated the dragon to become a cop but also cost frank's cousin his life frank orchestrated that so here's the deal, man. And like, now he's being blackmailed by the vicious circle. Yes. Great way to end it. The Rodney thing with the human guy with the green mohawk. Great way to end it. Three issues when many of the other image had four. More stuff communicated in three issues than four issues of any of the other stuff. Very clear what the character is, who the character is, and keeping it consistent with the things that we read in interviews, which is divorced from almost every Very true. Uh, other image uh, guy. Eric Larson, older than uh, a lot of the dudes, it, like been involved in comics longer than most, man. I, mean, I, I guess it, maybe it's neck and neck between he, him and Silvestri, who was in the game longer or something, man. But he has a couple more years under his belt than, uh, than the other dudes. Maybe that has something a little bit to, uh, to do with it. But, um, you know, of, of the image miniseries, man, this is the strongest. No doubt. 
Yeah, I think he's definitely done the most writing mm -hmm. as well. Um, I think it shows his writing ability here. But I mean, like, professionally after this, you know, like, there's a lot of series that he would go on to write and not draw, both for Image and his characters, but also, like, Marvel and stuff would hire him to write various series. So I think he's probably the most accomplished writer, um, and it, it it's pretty good. It's it's on display in this miniseries. He had ideas, and he was able to communicate them in a very entertaining and pretty much concise way. Like, there's yeah. a lot of stuff packed into this, and it doesn't feel confusing. It doesn't feel glossed over. He doesn't rely on captions or, or narration to, like you know for exposition or anything like it's i think it's well done i was impressed on the reread because like it's been decades since i've read this stuff and you never know how that's going to go i even had a conversation with somebody leading up to this before i reread it and uh we were talking savage dragon and i was like you should give the miniseries a, a try maybe <laughs> because i hadn't reread it yet and you never know um i'm happy to say like this was very fun yeah agreed agreed man uh v like very breezy I think it's a good lesson in um, laying out a superhero comic, you know, a comic of this kind. Um, you could use it as a, as a good template, I think, man. Um, I, I was studying issue ones and stuff over the past uh, couple of years, actually, man. And uh, pretty good issue one, you know, like Kirby's, Kirby's the master. And uh, if you study Kirby, you probably do okay. And I think Larson is an example of that. Yeah, I think that's fair. A couple questions I enjoy. One is, will the dragon have a crossover with Pitt? Uh, he says, I hope so. I don't think that ever happened, unfortunately. That bums me out because I, I would have liked that. And then another of my favorite questions is, um, are you related to Gary Larson, the guy who does the far side? <laughs> and he's not. They spell their names differently, but I like seeing a, a far side reference pop up in there. And that's it. This was an oversized issue story-wise. Look at that right there, boy. You're right, Ed. It's not it, because this is uh, J. Scott Campbell, eventually. Jeffrey Scott here. Piece of fan art, man. And we knew this name from Nintendo Power, because he also... Like, the character of mine that I sent to Larson to be a supervillain was for my video game uh, design thing that I sent to Nindo Nintendo Power, and I lost to this guy. Interesting. You know, like, he, he his game was sh featured in the uh, contest that they were promoting for a long time. So it's like, that name... Uh, it was the bane of all of our existences when we were young. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm, I'm trying to picture, like, timing-wise, probably a year after this, he starts working at Wild Storm somewhere in there. Some, somewhere in 93, I believe. Yeah, I think so. And uh, the Art Adams love is clearly on display here. Like, when you see this, and and you see it throughout in, some, in the, wizard, the wizard art shit, it's, like, completely professional-looking work, like, where are you, motherfucker? Well, we know where he is. All right, Ed. Any other thoughts on Savage Dragon? I said my piece. Shouts to Eric Larson, man, and his, and his road to uh, 300 issues. 300 issues doing it himself, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> and not including these issues, by the way. Because right. he starts over. Some of the image books would just launch from the miniseries in regular numbering. They just keep going. Uh, he starts over with an issue one has done lots of uh, kind of extras here and there too, halves and zeros and little filling in the blanks because you talk about the story here and how it has more than most of the image stuff. He was still packing story. Like between this and the ongoing series, things happen that were supposed to be an image zero, which was years delayed. Um, so he is just bursting and, and you know, I, I think it comes across on the page. I did notice that your image zero uh, coupon was ripped out, man. So I'm assuming you, you got I do, yeah, zero. yeah. I got an image zero. Very, very late. Nah, I dig. All right. Let's get the heck out of here, man. We have our own comics to make, our own miniseries to draw and such. K Fabers, we are on the road to 15,000 subscribers. Uh, please uh, like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon uh, on the Cartoonist K Fabe channel. We'll let you know when we have new vids available. And uh, shouts to subscribers new and old. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video. Lot, can, lots of good stuff in there too, man. Behind the scenes things and such. And you can fo you, and you can pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe merch and t-shirts at the links below this video. All right, like I said, we have comics to draw. Jimmy, give them those marching orders. Let's get the heck out of here. Read more comics.